Hey, uh, Cryptozens. Welcome back to the Crypto Overnighter. My name is Nicodemus, and we do crypto news analysis nightly at 10 p.m. And keep in mind, none of this should be considered financial advice. And it's Thursday, March 16th, 2023. Brian Brooks is the former acting head of the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency. And he said that bank regulatory agencies under the Biden administration have decided that crypto is risky and should be removed from the banking system. Now recently, Silvergate Bank, which served crypto companies, decided to liquidate and to shut down voluntarily. Also, Silicon Valley Bank, which had some crypto clients, was closed down by the California Department of Financial Protection and Innovation due to inadequate liquidity and insolvency. And then New York State banking regulators shut down Signature Bank. Now, Signature is a New York-based firm with, surprise, crypto clients. This last week in the FDIC took receivership of Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank. Brooks is now a board member of blockchain company Bitfury. And he mentioned that during his time as head of OCC, he had a weekly call with the FDIC chairman and the Federal Reserve vice chairman. These calls were used to discuss priorities for the week, how they could support each other, and how their actions could affect the banking system. So he was plugged into the system pretty tightly. Now Brooks restated his earlier comments at the Milken Conference in Washington, D.C. that the Biden administration is attempting to shut down crypto. He referred to this operation as Choke Point 2.0, and he said that it would be the biggest story for the next six months. The original Operation Choke Point was an Obama-era initiative. It investigated banks' business dealings with high-risk firms suspected of fraud and money laundering. According to Brooks, regulators are attempting to send a signal that it will choke off the use of crypto. He is 100% confident that regulators are working together to shut down banks. On Tuesday, the New York Department of Financial Services attempted to clarify that Signature Bank's closure was not due to crypto. But people aren't buying it. People like me. They're also not buying that it was due to a lack of confidence in the bank's leadership. The bank had been trying to decrease its exposure to crypto in recent weeks. Despite the department's claims that the bank's closures were not related to crypto, Brian Brooks is convinced that they were absolutely intentional. And while he believes that there is a coordinated effort by regulators to choke off crypto, he also thinks that smaller banks will always be willing to work with crypto companies, even if larger banks won't. Now, it seems to me like it would be better if the larger banks with their better risk management served the sector. Now, since state regulators shut down Signature on Saturday, the bank has been put up for sale. However, any buyer interested in purchasing the bank must agree to a significant condition. No dealing with crypto. On Wednesday, sources familiar with the situation told Reuters about this requirement. Now, Signature Bank had 25% of its deposits from crypto clients. Reports suggest that the DOJ and the SEC were investigating Signature for weak monitoring. They say that they may have facilitated some money laundering. In February, Signature Bank faced a class action lawsuit. That suit claimed that the bank had facilitated FTX's fraud. The lawsuit accused Signature of allowing FTX customer funds to be combined with Signet, which is the bank's blockchain-based payment network. The closure of three crypto-friendly banks, including Signature Bank, has led some people in the crypto industry, people like Brian Brooks, to speculate that regulators are working together to remove the crypto industry from the banking system entirely. Barney Frank is a former Democratic congressman who co-authored the Dodd-Frank Act. It's his name that's on it. He's also a board member of Signature Bank. Now, Frank is convinced that this takeover was motivated by anti-crypto sentiments. He told CNBC that Signature Bank was financially stable and regulators intervened to make a statement. Frank said, quote, I think part of what happened was that regulators wanted to send a very strong anti-crypto message. Now, Reuters reported that bids to buy Signature Bank are due on March 17th. Last year, the Federal Home Loan Bank of San Francisco gave $4.3 billion to Silvergate Bank. Now, some people have thought that the reason Silvergate shut down was because the bank forced them to repay the money. However, FHLB said on Wednesday that this wasn't true. A spokesperson for the bank said that they didn't ask Silvergate to repay the money. Silvergate made the decision to repay the money all on their own. March 1st, Silvergate Capital revealed in a securities filing that it had to sell securities quickly. 
They said that they sold those securities to get the money needed to repay the advances from the Federal Home Loan Bank of San Francisco. By the beginning of this month, it had completely paid back those loans. Now, people in the crypto industry have wondered if this early repayment is what caused the bank run on Silvergate. Because the day after Silvergate made that disclosure, its stock price fell sharply. A few days later, the company had said that it would stop operating and liquidate voluntarily. Now, the spokesperson for FHLB San Francisco said that they couldn't guess what led Silvergate Bank to repay early. However, they didn't actually have all that much time left to pay those loans off anyway. Now, sometimes, if a borrower experiences a, quote, material adverse change, the bank could ask for early repayment. But this didn't happen with Silvergate. The bank didn't force Silvergate to repay early. They said that any borrower in their situation would evaluate their position and make their own decisions about what to do. Now, the bank said that they couldn't talk about transactions specific to their members when asked if there was a decision not to roll over Silvergate's advance. The U.S. Federal Reserve plans to launch its real-time payments system in July. Now, I've talked about this before. I recently did an episode on this called Reflections FedNow. This new system called the FedNow service will allow for immediate access to funds and operate 24-7. The goal is to reduce the amount of time that it takes to clear financial transactions between institutions. The FedNow service will start certifying its first participants in August. Some people are viewing FedNow as a challenge to the crypto sector's fast transaction speeds. The chief operating officer at the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston is Kent Montgomery, and he's urging financial institutions and industry partners to prepare to join the FedNow service. Montgomery has been working on the new system, which he says will provide a modern instant payment solution. Now, some people are looking at FedNow as a potential precursor to a central bank digital currency. I don't know that that's true. I mean, keep in mind, this service could also undermine one of the advantages of a digital dollar specifically the ability to transfer money instantly. Federal Reserve officials have not made any decisions about a U.S. CDBC yet. Federal Reserve Chair Powell has said a number of times that they believe that the public, Congress, and the Biden administration must support the idea before proceeding with it. Some federal officials believe the proliferation of private stablecoins indicate a need for a real-time payment network. Janet Seiberg is an analyst at TD Cowan. And she said that the new system might benefit crypto investors who want to fund and cash out trades without leaving cash or digital dollars on a trading platform. Now, all that said, the Fed's system won't be the first of its kind because the banking industry already launched its own RTP network, which has been operational since 2017. This private sector competitor is quite similar to FedNow's new system for transactions. Chair Gensler has restated his view that proof-of-stake tokens might be considered securities under the Howey test. Gensler spoke to reporters after a commission vote on Wednesday. He explained that investors who buy tokens supported by a proof-of-stake consensus mechanism do so expecting to make a profit. He says that expectation might be enough to trigger securities laws. Gensler suggested that entrepreneurs and developers should seek compliance. And Gensler made these remarks in response to a question from reporters about Rostin Benham's statements. Now, Benham is the chair of the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, and he has said that Ether is a commodity and should be regulated by his agency. So again, Gensler and Benham don't agree on a basic legal fact. And we're expected to navigate this mess? That's awesome. The Commodity Futures Trading Commission and the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission have disagreed in the past about who should regulate the crypto markets. Gensler has classified Bitcoin as a commodity. However, he has not been willing to give up control over the other cryptocurrencies, like Ether. Now, Gensler has stated that most of the existing thousands of cryptocurrencies are securities. In September of 2022, Gensler said that proof-of-stake tokens might be investment contracts. Therefore, they would be subject to securities laws. Now keep in mind, this was only after the Ethereum blockchain's upgrade to proof of stake. On March 15th, a court in New York allowed Binance US to move forward with acquiring Voyager Digital. This despite the US government's objection. 
Judge Michael Wiles said that any delays in the deal would harm the interest of Voyager's former clients, because these are people who are waiting for a return of their funds. Now, Wiles reaffirmed his previous approval of Voyager Digital's Chapter 11 bankruptcy plan. This plan involves selling billions of dollars in assets to Binance US in order to regain liquidity and pay back customers. The court refused the government's request to delay the confirmation order. The appeal was filed on March 14th, and it accused the bankruptcy plan of protecting individuals involved in fraud, theft, or tax avoidance. The government also demanded the removal of the provision that prevents them from legally pursuing those involved in the sale. Now, Judge Wiles did not agree with these accusations, and he ruled to proceed with the bankruptcy plan. However, he upheld the current stay, which is set to end on March 20th. On March 7th, on March 7th, the court already approved the acquisition of Voyager. Judge Wiles allowed the trading platform to finalize the sale and provide repayment tokens to affected Voyager customers. The SEC's arguments against the redistribution of funds from Voyager to Binance US were dismissed by the judge, who stated that it did not violate US securities laws. The court's decision was based on the support of 97% of the Voyager account holders for the restructuring plan. As per the latest estimates, the plan is likely to result in Voyager creditors recovering around 73% of the value of their funds. The European Parliament voted in favor of the Digital Identity Framework proposed by the European Union. This framework will provide citizens with their own wallet and access to public services. The legislation includes zero-knowledge proof technology to safeguard users' privacy. ZK Proof helps protect privacy by confirming a position without exposing unnecessary data. According to Ramana Yurkovic, who led the Parliament's negotiations on the digital identity file, the implementation of ZK Proof technology is planned for the European Digital Identity Wallet. This technology will allow users to have greater control over the sharing of their personal data. It will also strengthen the principles of selective disclosure and data minimization. The file will proceed to inter-institutional negotiations. Yurkovic emphasized that existing privacy-enhancing technologies must work together as they develop. This is particularly important for aligning with the EU's General Data Protection Regulation. Now, Yurkovic stressed the importance of giving users of the European Digital Identity Wallet greater control over their own data. To achieve this goal, all technical solutions that can help should be considered and discussed. This is why the Parliament has included ZK proofs in its position. On March 16th, Peck Shield tweeted that the person who hacked Euler Finance for $196 million was using Tornado Cash to move the stolen funds. Now, we talked about this guy just last night, and this happened just a few hours after a $1 million reward was offered to find the hacker's identity. The hacker used a flash loan to attack Ethereum's non-custodial lending protocol. PeckShield also mentioned that the exploiter was on the move. The person who hacked Euler Finance transferred about $1.65 million worth of Ethereum using Tornado Cash. And as we talked about last night, Euler sent a message to the hacker's address warning that if 90% of the stolen funds were not returned within 24 hours, they would offer a bounty for the hacker's arrest and the return of the funds. The hacker did not return the funds, and instead moved some of the stolen money into Tornado Cash. Probably means that the hacker is not that interested in Euler's amnesty offer. Now, Peck Shield noticed that the hacker sent about 100 Ethereum, which is about $165,000, to a wallet address that appears to belong to one of the victims. The wallet address had previously sent a message begging the hacker to return their life savings. This prompted other victims to also send messages to the same address, hoping the hacker would return their funds as well. One message from an apparent victim said that they were part of 26 families from rural areas who'd lost a total of $1 million. They added that their share of the funds was their life savings from decades of work in factories. Another victim messaged the attacker to congratulate them on the big win and to say that they invested funds in Euler that they desperately needed for a house. He also mentioned that his wife would be very upset if they couldn't afford the house, and so asked the hacker for help. Circle announced that it has worked through most of the requests for the redemption of their USDC stablecoin. 
According to their statement, they handled those requests from March 13th to March 15th. They redeemed $3.8 billion worth of USDC and created $0.8 billion. Circle experienced a bank run last week after revealing that its $3.3 billion stablecoin reserves were held in the bankrupt Silicon Valley Bank. This caused USDC to lose its peg. In response, Circle released an update. They said that the events of the past week have affected their liquidity operations for USDC, and they said that they're trying to reestablish services with other banking partners, especially for payment and USDC redemption services. Circle reported that it started using a new banking partner on March 14th. They also used that same partner for international wires to and from 19 countries on March 15th. Now, Cross River Bank is Circle's new commercial banking partner. They also serve Coinbase. They announced this partnership on March 13th, and Circle also increased its partnership with its current custodian, BNY Mellon. USDC has had a difficult time recently. This has led to many to lose their money because they were trying to escape from a rapidly declining asset. During this period, one crypto user paid over $2 million to receive five cents worth of Tether in a panic to withdraw from the crash. Analysis showed that they may have forgotten to set slippage on their transaction, which would allow a bot to make a substantial profit. And that's going to do it for us tonight. I want to thank you, my listeners, because when you stop listening, I will stop talking. If you enjoyed tonight's show, then please like, follow, subscribe, leave a rating or review. And in the meantime, we'll see you tomorrow night.